So good to be with you all tonight. Um, as, we, as we begin to think about the sermon tonight, the scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians, uh, the letter from Paul to the church at Corinth. And these New Testament letters, the typical pattern is to begin with uh, the signature. So we learn first that Paul and his comrade Sosthenes um, were the authors of this letter. And then we hear the, um, the greeting, so we know that it's to the church at Corinth. And then we hear a prayer. That prayer is typically the next thing that follows, the prayer for the community. And then we also remember as we read these letters that although it was written to the church at Corinth, because it is canonized, because it is in our Bible, it's also a letter to us. So it's kind of like we're being uh, forwarded this email and we overhear again what is said to the church at Corinth, but it could also be uh, not just God's church in Corinth, but God's church in Gainesville. And so that's where we are as we begin the letter to 1 Corinthians. So I invite you to hear these words, um, this letter to Corinth and to us. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then now his prayer. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God, and God's people say, thanks be to God. <clears throat> so now I invite you to bow your heads and pray for me in sharing this message with you as I pray for you in receiving it. Let's pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, um, when I was pregnant with our first child, Shelby Hart, I was leading a disciple Bible study class. So Shelby got a lot of Bible study from day one. And I was pregnant right about from the beginning of that class and ended the class just in time to go to the hospital and have Shelby. And I think when I announced the pregnancy, one of the women in the class, um, Margaret, began making a quilt because then she gave it to me immediately after Shelby was born. This is the, the quilt that she made um, for Shelby. And a quilt, to me, is a great metaphor for the church because the different fabric chosen and the pattern all have particular meaning and come together in a way to make this beautiful quilt. You know, in this letter, Paul talks about the community, the koinonia of the church. Um, koinonia is that word that is translated fellowship. And he reassures the uh, church at Corinth 
that they are not lacking in any spiritual gift to strengthen them, and that these gifts will sustain them until the very end as they are followers of Christ. They each have gifts to give. Now, the language of spiritual gift may sound like something overly religious or very unusual, but Paul names several gifts over the course of his letters, many of which are things that we would consider to be pretty typical gifts or skills or talents. Spiritual gifts are things like teaching and wisdom and um, leadership and mercy. He lists them in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. And those lists aren't exhaustive. There may be others. And each of us... Paul says, is given a spiritual gift, uh, that as a follower of Christ, we have that, and God has given it to us, to each person, and, and gifted us in a particular way. And together we can use our gifts for the good of the whole and to strengthen and sustain the fellowship, the koinonia of the church. The quilt is a, is a great example of that. Each quilter can tell you that each piece of fabric selected has a particular role to play. You know, I think about all of this off-white color, and we wouldn't necessarily see the pattern in the quilt without this off-white, but the off-white just kind of has a supporting role. So maybe this uh, background color could be um, identified as the gift of helps. And, and then there are some that are a little bolder. I don't know if you can see this one, but it's kind of one of the darkest ones and boldest ones. And, and because it's so strong and bold, maybe this one could represent the gift of leadership or prophecy. Uh, and then this one is, is still a little bit stronger and yet kind of has a lyrical look to it. Um, there's there's a, a string of flowers on it, and, and I kind of think maybe that one is the, is the gift of, of teaching. Um, and there's some other smaller patterns that are, that are very orderly, and maybe this could represent the gift of administration. But all of those gifts come together to make the beauty of, of that quilt. The point is that every gift is necessary for the whole, and when they are offered together... They make the most beautiful quilt. Now, you might be thinking, but I, I, I don't have a gift. Um, each of us has been given a gift, and the challenge is just for us to discover it and then to trust the one who has given it to us to enable us, empower us, uh, embolden us to be able to use it. For each of us, discovering our gift is finding that voice that God has called us to use, finding our part to play in the fabric of the quilt. You know, as followers of Christ, we are challenged to find that voice, to discover that gift that God has given each one of us, and to trust that God can help us to use that for the good of the whole. As we discover it and offer it, I believe that we will be able to sense that it pleases God for us to do so. So let me share with you how it was that I was able to discover my gift. It's what I share when someone asks me how I ended up in ministry. It's what I share when uh, someone asks me, Um, why I'm called, it helps me to remember that call, and it's what I call up on days when I just simply want to run away from home. It's my call, and it was the first step for me to discover um, my voice and what it was that God was calling me to do. It happened one summer, uh, on a summer evening, And I was at my roommate's wedding rehearsal in New Hope, North Carolina, 
or somewhere in North Carolina. The church was called New Hope Baptist Church. And they were having this informal rehearsal dinner, pig picking. Now, the only person that I knew there was, were the bride and the groom. Uh, all of the other bridesmaids and groomsmen were from their hometown, and I was the only person that was there that wasn't from that crowd. So I will admit, after dinner, everybody was sitting around talking, and I decided I would slip out and go to the bathroom. So I went, left the fellowship hall, and I went into um, the area where I think the bathrooms were, and it was dark, and I couldn't really tell exactly where I was. And then when my eyes adjusted to the light, I realized that I was in the narthex of their sanctuary. And so I thought, oh, I'll just escape into the sanctuary. It was smaller than this space. I really think it was, well, yeah. It may have had as many pews, but not quite as wide. Um, so it was smaller than this space. And I went and I sat on the back row. Because when I was growing up at Trinity in Ga uh, over on 8th Avenue, I would slip into the sanctuary and I would go up to the balcony, to the very back row of the balcony, and I would just sit and pray, and I would look at the stained glass window, that very same stained glass window. So I went into the back row of this little sanctuary space and sat and began to pray. And as I was praying, I, I just began to feel a little restless or agitated. So I just got up and I moved about halfway up. And I sat on a row about halfway up. And I still was just uncomfortable. So I got up and I, I sat on the front row. And I thought, okay, God, you want me up close? I will get on the front row. So I sat on the front row and I continued to pray. And I still was agitated and, and kind of pulled to move. So I thought, okay, God, you want me on my knees. So I went up and I knelt down at the kneeling bench and I began to pray. And I still just felt uncomfortable, felt pulled, literally almost like I had a string on my chest pulling me. And so I got up, and I followed what I was feeling, and I went and I stood at the pulpit, a place where I would never, ever want to be. And I remember putting my hands on the pulpit, as I had seen Reverend Odine Martin do so many times when I was growing up. And as I stood there, I just had this tremendous sense of peace come over me. And I felt this voice within me that said, this, this is where I want you to be. So I stood there for a moment. And then... Um, my heart was beating so fast that I literally, almost literally, ran out of the chapel. Ran out of the chapel. And, and I needed more, and so I went to look for a Bible. And I went and looked in a Sunday school class, and then another Sunday school class, and another Sunday school class. I was in a Baptist church, and they all bring their own Bibles, and I couldn't find a Bible. <sighs> but I did find this gospel parallel and so I began to read. It's got all four Gospels kind of lined up beside each other so you can see what's in each one. And, you know, I really hoped that I would find one of those verses that said that women should be silent in church, right? Or that women shouldn't have any authority over men. I could have become a biblical literal, literalist if I had found one of those Bibles and those passages. But instead, I found this gospel parallel. I have one that's like the one that I read from. And instead of finding any of those passages that would get me off the hook, I came across this in Matthew and in Luke. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Ask, therefore, the Lord of the harvest 
to send out laborers into God's harvest. And I knew that God was calling me into ministry to be a preacher. Now, some of you may know that I actually hate public speaking. It is something that I always struggled with. I didn't do well in speech classes in in high school or in college. Um, Even in seminary, when I was supposed to stand up in front of somebody, my hands and my knees would begin to shake. I would begin to not be able to breathe. I really do not like public speaking. Um, I couldn't make words come out of my mouth right. It is still one of the hardest things that I do But whether I like it or not, whether I'm comfortable with it or not, whether uh, I think I do well at it or not, the years have increasingly become, made it clear to me that this is where God wants me to be. And this is where God has called me to be. And I cannot be content. I am restless. I am agitated unless I am offering this gift to the community. And when I preach, I know that it pleases God. There's a movie, uh, came out in 1981, Chariots of Fire. I'm sure many of you remember that movie. It's a movie about Eric Little, a missionary, um, and also a U.S. Olympic runner. And there's one scene where Eric is having a conversation with his sister. And she doesn't want him to mess with all of this running stuff. She just wants him to go and to be a missionary. And she asks him directly why it is that he needs to run. And his response is, when I preach, I know, I mean, when I run, I know that it pleases God. When I preach, (laughs) I know that it pleases God. It may make me incredibly uncomfortable. It may be a struggle for me and and a sacrifice, an act of self-denial on my part, and that may sound kind of weird, but really for me, it is denying my natural inclination, which is not to speak publicly and to do what I would prefer not to do. But I do it because I know that when I preach, it pleases God. Your gift may not be preaching. Uh, You may have a passion for social justice. We call that the gift of prophecy. You may have the gift of helping or the gift of prayer or the gift of encouragement, or healing, or, or generosity, or compassion. Everyone does have at least one gift with which God has uniquely gifted you. You're afraid you might not be able to figure it out? Um, well, there are spiritual gifts, inven- gift inventories that you can take. I can tell you how to take one of those. Um, I can tell you where to read some, an overview of what those gifts are like. They're quick and easy and, and they can give you a sense, but the most important thing for you to do is just to begin to pray, to listen, to begin to seek clarity about what your gifts are. Your gifts may or may not be what you think they are. I never would have thought that my gift was preaching But once you discover your gifts, then I invite you how, I invite you to explore how it is that God might be calling you to offer those gifts to the community. Because each one of our gifts is simply that. It is a, it is a gift that we are given not for ourselves, but for the community. And if it's challenging or it's intimidating for you to think about offering your gifts, The leap of faith for you may be trusting God enough to lead you into it. Trusting God to lead you out of your comfort zone to offer your gift for building up the community, the koinonia, the body 
of Christ. The whole point is that together we are given all of the gifts that we need, all of the gifts that are necessary for the whole community. We're not lacking anything that we need. No gifts and no parts are unimportant. Whether you think of it in terms of the fabric that make up the quilt or every instrument that makes up the orchestra, we are each given a gift to share with the body of Christ. And when we find our voice and discover that gift, we will find that deep joy and contentment. And when we offer our gifts to the community for the good of the whole, then I am confident that it pleases God. So I encourage you, find your gift. Seek out your gift. Pray to God and ask God what it is each of us has been given one. And then seek out how you can offer that gift to the community. No gift is unimportant. And together... When we offer those gifts, we will all be pleasing God. Maybe Kinley's going to grow up and be a preacher. Let's pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have given to each one of us those that we may freely and comfortably want to share with others and those that make us uncomfortable, those that in sharing may actually be an act of sacrifice or self-denial. So God, give us the courage to offer what we have. Give us the wisdom to seek for the gifts that you have given to us. And in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we are, may we build up the body, the body of Christ, your church. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.